Welcome to the Girlfriend God Podcast, a podcast in search of and in service to the Divine Feminine, bringing you an equal mix of academic research and emotional spiritual experience. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment. If you enjoy this podcast, share it with your friends, rate and review it if you're listening on a streaming platform. Follow on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Now, let's get in the flow. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the Girlfriend God podcast. Today, I'm happy to welcome my occasional co-host, Dr. Carla Ionescu. I'm happy to welcome Liz Childs Kelly, who is also the podcast host of Home to Her and Coenette. Ruah. Thank you. I can never pronounce that word. Devorah Gren, and I'm going to go around the room and let each of them introduce themselves to the audience. Carla and Liz have been on the show before. Devorah, you met earlier in this season, uh, but I'm going to, this is the first time all three of them have met each other. So ladies, go in whatever order you see fit or, or go in the Hollywood squares order. So on my screen, <laughs> oh, no. on my screen that's Carla, Liz, and then Devorah. Okay, sure. Okay, let's do that. Uh, so hi, my name is Dr. Carla Ionescu. My PhD is in ancient history. I am a professor at York University in Canada. Uh, my focus is the goddess Artemis, whose book I don't have on me that I wrote a book on Artemis called She Who Hunts, and I'm writing another one, hopefully soon. Um, I also host the Goddess Project, which is a podcast about the divine feminine and goddesses in the ancient world and i sometimes co-host with kelly to have a good time yes thanks carla liz oh right i was next um i'm liz childs kelly and i am the host of the home to her podcast which is dedicated to amplifying all the many voices of the sacred feminine um in its fourth year now so have talked to some pretty amazing people um And I'm the author of the book, Home to Her, Walking the Transformative Path of the Sacred Feminine, which reflects um, some of my own research that I've done over the years, plus my personal experiences on researching the goddess and the divine feminine. I'm very proud to say that the book is a 2023 recipient of a Gold Nautilus Award. So kind of, kind of cycle like that. Hey, that's me. Hi, everyone. I'm Ruach Devorah Gren, um, coming out publicly with this title for the first time right now, Kelly, <laughs> of En Kohenet. Kohenet is a Hebrew priestess, and I realized uh, in a meditation a couple of weeks ago that I'm a bridge very much between the land I often live in, Mesopotamia, <laughs> 4,000, 5,000 years ago, and temple period, and of course, modern times and modern feminism. So the N is meant to uh, signify that. Anyhow, um, let's see, I founded the Lilith Institute, which has been dedicated to the sacred feminine. uh, And we're now in our 26th year. And I did it as I was finishing my thesis on Lilith, which resulted in a book called Lilith's Fire. And uh, some years later, I put together an anthology with the help of, uh, of uh, I think, 72, I still can't believe it, 72 amazing women uh, from 25 spiritual traditions. It's an anthology of sacred writings, blessings, prayers, oriki, uh, meditations, and so on. Um, and I am a former co-director of the Women's Spirituality Master's Program, which started at New College and then went to Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, which became Sophia University. But uh, except for Napa Valley College, I left the academy in 2015 and started focusing on my institute's own classes and work and just completed the leadership program with a wonderful group of women and uh, and now focused again on, on yet other things, other classes and very excited to be here. I have uh, also a podcast, um, one which 
concluded after 50 episodes, Tending Lilith's Fire, that I did with Annie Matan, uh, also a Kohenet, and um, Grown Ass Women's Conversations with Chavel and Richards, which is uh, just, we've done just three, but I hope we will be able to do more. And just very happy to be here with all of you accomplished women. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's so fabulous. <laughs> I just smile through your whole resume, Tavora, and I think I can speak for everyone when we say how happy we are to have you here, and I think we're all kind of in awe and admiration of you. I think it's a mutual admiration society, but thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, with each one of you, I have had these individual conversations, so now we're kind of kind of have this panel discussion, which like our, you know, like our one-on-one -on -one conversations have been, we're going to just see where the conversation takes us. But individually, I've spoken to all of you about this problem that what I perceive as a problem, because I have been on both sides of the fence of being an academic, right? Because I was in a master's program. Uh, my master's is in library and information science. So technically I'm a librarian, even though I'm not currently employed as a librarian. But having worked in a university library as a graduate student and served as a librarian after that, uh, as a metadata librarian in a preservation company, and having been a spiritual seeker all of my life, I see a disconnect between real hardcore academic facts-based evidence-based research about spiritual topics like source information about goddess worship goddess cults goddess community and the modern day goddess spirituality seeker whose only research tool, or at least only research tool that most people are aware of, is Google. <laughs> so since I spent a lot of time, mostly during the pandemic, I kind of had this resurgence of my pagan roots, and I was involved in a lot of online communities, as most people were during the pandemic. Um, so I fell in with a lot of witchcraft circles and Facebook groups and chat groups and Zoom meetings and all of that. And I saw an alarming amount of misinformation. And I feel like this disconnect is largely responsible for that. So... That's why I titled this episode, you know, Bridging the Gap, uh, you know, of this. So how, So, what do we do about that? What do we do about this huge chasm of, you know, real world facts-based information and misinformation where the internet is both our greatest asset, but also evil? <laughs> you know and anyone can anyone can go first speak as the spirit moves you as they would say <laughs> I can, I'll go first um, I posted this video recently on the Minoan um, and when I was in the Iraqian Iraqian museum I took a video of the Minoan uh, palace at Knossos and I had had this conversation with Laura Perry, who is not technically a PhD, but has done tremendous research in Minoan civilization. Um, and so I had had this interview with her. Anyways, I posted this maybe 20 second video saying that the palace of Knossos may not have been a palace. The Minoans may not have had a kingship, blah, blah. And it blew up like in a good way for me because it gave me a bunch of followers uh, and and I appreciate that, but but a lot of the so I got two of the same comments, mostly from dudes. Sorry, dudes who are watching this. Um, two of the same comments. Number one, Laura Perry is not a scholar. Okay, I think I called her a scholar, and I was literally in my parking lot, just kind of reading. 
like just kind of saying stuff, you know, over the video. Laura Perry is not a scholar. Okay. I looked her up and I didn't find her PhD, this kind of stuff. Okay. Um, to which I then direct them to some of her research and, and her blogs and stuff like that. The other one I get is, um, well, of course they had kings. They had King Minos and they had da 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 and they had da da Then I get like those dudes that did the Google homework, you know. I had one this morning who was okay, you know, but telling me, well, the Mycenaeans had arrived there and then the Minoans came after, to which I replied, a simple Google search would just give you the dates. Go, you know, go do your homework and come back. Yeah. Um, like, so the reason I bring this up is because it garnered so much commentary and it, it brought so much of both. Like I had some people that had some knowledge. I had some people that had no knowledge. I had people, you know, and I, I think it really brought home to me. And so at one point when I got really snotty, when someone was really talking about, oh, Laura Perry, this, that, and I said, you know, uh, or no, somebody said to me, oh, you call yourself a historian, you know, but you're quoting someone that's not a scholar. And I said, well, I don't call myself a historian. I am one. My PhD was approved by like eight other PhD at a university. And my PhD allows me to discern whether someone's research is is good. You don't have to have a PhD to do good research, right? Um, so I don't know if this answers your question, but I think this is the pro like this is the problem. And I don't know. I don't know if anyone else knows how to answer these things in a diplomatic way. Um, but this has been my dilemma just the last week. It's been pretty nuts. Wow. I think sometimes uh, we maybe have to stop worrying about diplom diplomacy, although I do, but I'm losing patience, you know, with some of these things. And, um, and certainly I agree with you that um, there are many amazing independent scholars, Max Dash, who comes right to mind, and many others, yeah, who don't have the degree, and it doesn't matter. Um, and I don't, I think I can say that and not feel I'm denigrating your degree, my degree, or, you know, and I don't know about Liz, you know, or Kelly, you, yours, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. It's like having a spiritual leader who's got the credentials to be clergy, but has no empathy or has no pizzazz, you know, it doesn't inspire people when they give a sermon, you know, so it is a really individual thing. As far as Google, years ago, I would always tell students, I guess 20 years ago we're talking, or a little more, uh, don't even use Google as a source. I mean, that because it was still, you know, nascent. And over time, it's gotten better. And so maybe 10, 12 years ago, I started allowing it, but I would say always check Google with another place of research you know it's as simple as going as you know to the footnotes and or the bibliography you know mostly the sources i mean and and going there and seeing if those are legit because often now they are definitely the right people the right who you'd want to read or quote um so the fact that it's on wikipedia doesn't matter so actually what i'm talking about is wikipedia not not google per se um it's gotten hard to distinguish and who knows who's writing what now, especially with all this nonsense about AI. And uh, I find that very frightening, you know, to imagine that, not imagine it's happening, that artificial intelligence is putting out a lot of the information you might find on Google. So I think we have to be really vigilant and, and check, you know, now I would probably say check three sources, you know, if you want to claim anything as a, as a scholar or a student. Um, so that's just my first, my first pass on it. Trying to organize my thoughts. I'm really glad you both went first <laughs> because I have lots of like, you know, the, the ideas here. I'm like, will they come together into a coherent sentence? Let's give it a try. I don't know. Um, <laughs> my, so I, I don't have a PhD in the subject. I have a master's degree in communication theory um, and had a first career that was focused in um, public relations and communications and had my own communications firm. Um, and so I'm going on a little tangent here, bear with me. But um, one of the things that was important about the way that the divine feminine came to me personally was it was a deeply experiential thing. It was not. Um, it wasn't in a book. It wasn't it wasn't rooted in facts. and. Um, and so uh, there's always been a dance for me of honoring that, right? Like for me, that experience of the divine feminine is it's, it's, it's the body, it's experiential, it's, it's intuitive. And I've um, 
done, you know, priestess work around that to, to bring that in as well. And I, and yet I have sought out the facts and I, I don't know that I've even connected the dots that perhaps having a master's degree and just being a geek when it comes to learning, um, helped me use Google to point me towards like scholar. And I, I will sit down and read an academic book with the best of you. Like that makes me happy. Um, so it pointed me towards sources and I, and I feel like I had a grounding of, um, of what was what was legitimate and what wasn't for, through this other's master's degree program, um, and I'm just skeptical. You know, I, I think when I look around at the the landscape that you were referring to, Kelly, what I feel like I've noticed is um, it feels really largely influenced by social media, and people want something that's quick and pithy to click on, and so maybe they read like a meme that references something and then they throw a picture alongside it which is usually a white woman that's really thin and really beautiful um and you know like ah oh, goddess empowerment and and then it gets shared you know five thousand times and then that becomes our fact-based information um sometimes there aren't even sources quoted people just steal this stuff like it's kind of crazy they don't source the photos like it's and that that does concern me and it's not I think it concerns me even more, you know, the stealing and all that and the, the the lack of factual information is troubling. But what really bothers me is that there's this huge historical record out there that we aren't yeah. getting to people. Yeah. That's what really troubles me is that it is there and it's fascinating. And there are incredible women that have been pulling this research together over decades. You mentioned Max Deschew, especially people who are doing this at a time when it was really hard to do it for very little um, accolades and recognition um, and facing obstacles I can't even imagine. And I no money. Like to, <laughs> no money. And I would like to counter that um, because I think it's fascinating. It's interesting. It's our birthright. And I I want I want to get it to people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I um so uh, there's a couple of things I want to respond to. So first, yeah, I am certainly not suggesting that, um, you know, I had this whole rant several months ago about when did personal gnosis become a dirty word? Because I think there is value in that, right? I mean, Liz, you and I know, I had that whole thing with the green malachite and Ellen of the Ways, and that was not in any book. Right? right. That was right. something that I knew intuitively and that has to do with my ancestry and ancient Siberia and like that whole thing. And um, so, yes, I'm not undervaluing that there are some things that are very intuitive. And even when I was a practicing witch, there were a lot of things that I wanted to do intuitively as part of my my ritual work or ceremonial work. Um but I also, and I think you're right, maybe it's just a certain type of personality, like I'm like you, like I'm a geek and a nerd and, I, you know, I want to do things correctly. And I also know that as a practitioner of magic, that magic is very practical and I, I am well aware of the kind of energy that I'm working with and that not knowing what I'm doing is kind of dangerous. So I want to know what I'm doing, right? Because... I don't want to do it wrong. So I want to turn to ancient text that I know exists to make sure that I'm doing it right. Right. Because I don't want to, I don't know, accidentally raise a demon or something like that. You know what I mean? I'm exaggerating, but you know what I mean? Um, so, uh, so I get it. Yes. There is certainly value in personal gnosis, but I think like what you're saying, being influenced by social media and anyone watching this on YouTube saw my facial expressions uh, in regard to saying things like not quoting your sources, no referencing of material whatsoever. These are the things that drive me insane, especially as a librarian and an archivist and a preservationist for goddess's sake. I mean, come on. Um, yeah. I, nothing drives me more insane than seeing a quote without attributing someone, even if it's anonymous. Right. Quote anonymous. <laughs> um, but but I digress. Um, so 
I'm bothered by things. One of the things I wanted to ask about specifically is why do more people not know about, and I guess I'm changing topics here a little bit. I thought initially that the problem was that because especially with academic research, because so much of it is behind a paywall, right? I mean, we all know that good journal articles are often behind a paywall in a university library. Mm -hmm. um, but I am often surprised at how few people know about the internet archive. Mm -hmm. There's a world of accessible source material available mm -hmm. on the internet archive. That's 90% of what the internet archive is, are scanned documents from university libraries. Mm -hmm. Why do more people not know about this institution mm -hmm. and that it's accessible to them yeah. for free? Yeah. Um, I didn't know about this resource. I didn't know about it either. So thank you. <laughs> you know what I mean? I had no idea. Or no. you know what it is, right? I only really know about it in the last few years because I did, uh, I taught a class that was recorded on Zoom for an, an institution and they keep it up through that, through Internet Archive. But yeah, I don't go there for print. So thank you for the reminder. <laughs> I, I tend to go to academia.edu, which is such a wonderful storehouse yes. of information. Yeah. yeah. So the Internet Archive is a nonprofit organization, and its mission is to scan every book in the world ever written. Wow. Which is obviously a lofty goal that they're never going to achieve. However, they partner, they partner with many institutions, but the primary institutions that they partner with are university libraries. Mm -hmm. So they scan and make publicly available anything that's in the public domain. Which, do think, includes, which obviously includes a lot of very boring material that we would never want to read. Yeah, yeah. It also includes a lot of really cool stuff. And it, and it's not just books either. It's video and film and audio and live concerts. And I'm still I, amazed. I, I think that, I think that expecting the public to... Sorry, Kelly, I'm cutting you off. That's good. Um, I think that expecting the I think that expecting a lot of people to to pick up an academic article may be a little unrealistic. And I say that hesitantly because I did have somebody approach me about this video and say to me, oh, there are a lot of articles on JSTOR that you could read uh, about the Minoans. And I kind of laughed and I thought, oh, OK, you assumed I didn't read any of these. And so I think I don't know what the future holds because in one way, yes, there's lots of articles on JSTOR, but academics disagree with each other. So you got to read several, right? Like you, you got to really be passionate. Let's say if we take the Minoans, you got to be passionate about the Minoans. You got to fall down that rabbit hole. You got to do your work. And what you really find at the end is like, none of them have the answer anyways. Um, so, and then I had said, I think I said that this individual JSTOR is fantastic for students, like, you know, and for everyone, but it's five, seven years behind because it takes forever to publish something on JSTOR, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just, we're just having a conversation, dude. We're not making a published, uh, you know, about this this particular Gnosis, right? I'm right. not publishing a book saying, I, I know for sure that this was not a palace, right? We're having, so I don't know how to have these conversations where in, in one way you can say, yes, of course, read something that's academic. In another way you can say, well, the academics may not be right. Uh, in another way, you say, well, we have archaeological culture, but then you have to interpret that. You have to talk about bias. I mean, you should, I guess what I should say is take a course here. I should build one, you know, and but even then you expect people to read and mm -hmm. have opinions, not like you're just giving them facts and then they just right. go, oh, okay, now I know all the facts because then tomorrow there'll be some other fact that came up, mm -hmm. right? Um, I just want to interject to that that um one sad development that i see happening is you're talking about that they'll read they'll do the homework and for a certain kind of student that's true but there are some adult learners i'm finding in lifelong learning type of programs that really just want to show up uh, absorb the content of when you're teaching a live class and 
do very little reading. So it's been a real adjustment for me as an academic or former academic, who still it's in my blood, of course, you know, to uh, to maybe assign one article, you know, per class and hope they read it, you know, and I still will give a big bibliography and suggestions, but uh, it took me a while to stop being super disappointed that, it, you know, one or two people in a class of 20 might be interested enough to actually get the reading done in a, in a weekly class. So that's one development that I see that's uh, very sad. And I don't actually think it's limited to adult learners in, in these lifelong continuing ed programs. It's I've heard about it at all kinds of levels of, of universities of the students at, you know, in their 20s who are also not doing it. So and I think um, uh, what's been mentioned about social media, and Liz, you talked about this, um, has, of course, affected our people's attention spans and what they absorb as true. And fact, and the, the memes, yeah, I mean, they're funny and they're sometimes useful, but they're also killing us in, in a sense of not wanting to know more, not wanting to know more than a quote um, and not, you know, not really ever, I'm sure, most 98% of people ever checking the source. And I just want to say also one word that you brought up about the art, uh, the art not being credited, I know is a source of great concern to artists. Even uh, I've heard from a friend of mine that that even having your name credited isn't enough. They feel that the artist should also be paid, which I understand. But to not even give credit because you picked it up off of Pinterest is also inexcusable to me, as is not giving credit for a quote or an idea. Yeah. I'm, and you know, I was guilty of that. I mean, a few years ago, I think, because, and I'm thinking of this attitude of the internet is, well, it's all just there. It's all just free. Like if I can just Google it and find it, like I can do whatever I want with it. And so I was grateful. I have a, I've had a Facebook group for several years on this topic of the divine feminine. And I, it was through people sharing things, including me in there that, that kind and patient group members educated me on the protocol of that of like, Hey, this is not cool. Um, and I was grateful for that. I did always quote my, my sources, but I didn't always, um, credit the artist. And so I, yeah, it's, it's so important. Um, I think what I wanted to add to this too, is I've, again, I've been thinking about me and I, um, at the time when I started this journey, I lived in, um, California, I lived in the Bay area CIIS has a PhD program in women's spirituality, like right there in my, in my backyard. And um, I thought about many times so enrolling in that program. And for me, it seemed really important that I didn't because um, there was something about following the breadcrumbs of what was what was being shown to me and that I, I follow that path instead of having the gifted and wonderful teachers that I know are there lay out that path for me. And so I think, um, what, what is interested me about this subject is I, I, I know there will always be people like me who want to go on a deep dive into the research and they just, they want to know it, you know, like they're, it's important. And I think of the bias in history, just the extreme bias and how few of these stories we're actually getting. And th I know that that is what really lights me up is figuring out how to get that to people, not in an academic way, in a way that they can relate to and they can understand and that it is credible. But ideally, Carla, they're not in your position of like trying to defend, you know, like whatever, but they know that what they got was accurate. Um, and to do that in a way that's that's palatable and not boring. I think sometimes people hear history. I know nobody here thinks history is boring, but but I think sometimes people hear that that word and they think it's it's boring and it's it's so relevant to what's happening now. It gives us a framework. It tells us that this story that we've been told is not the only story, that there are actually many different aspects of the story, that a very small group of people have controlled the narrative, and yes. that when we start to hear other, other aspects and other stories, then we can start to envision something different for ourselves. And that's yeah. what I get super passionate about. And 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 then to me, it's it's less about like, yes, let's get the facts right. But or and you don't have to you don't have to enroll in a program. You do you don't have to. Like it, 
but you should know this because it belongs to you. Right. Yeah. I think that I, I feel like, and you know, Devorah, it's interesting because I, I think with, so with these two, I have had this conversation that you and a few other women and other women that, that we have talked to, I'm thinking of Glennis Livingstone in particular, along with a handful of other women that I think we probably both have secret longings that we want to have on our podcast, but we just haven't talked about it yet. There are these women who we consider our foremothers of this mm -hmm. goddess feminist spirituality. Mm -hmm. And we want to be like sponges and gather all of your knowledge. Uh, before you all shuffle off this mortal coil, <laughs> <laughs> so we can we can glean the knowledge that you guys have gathered over these decades because it does seem like, uh, like Liz was saying, how how do we, like maybe we are the bridge of knowledge, right? Because you have the these handful of us mm -hmm. geeks who do like to do research. But we also, you know, we're kind of cute and we have podcasts and we're funny and you know what I mean? Like we are the disseminators of information and I, because this is the culture that we live in and we're trying to work within the framework that we find ourselves in, mm -hmm. which is not in the halls of academia. It's in you know, the frame on somebody's phone watching YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to work with. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I can't speak for Liz or, or Carla or, or even you, Devorah. I mean, you know this, that's why you have a podcast still, mm -hmm. right? And I love yours. I mean, you know, you're relevant conversations with grown ass, you know, grown ass <laughs> conversations or whatever mm -hmm. it is. I mean, that's funny and it's eye catching and it's, and young people are going to be drawn to that. That title of a podcast would catch the attention of my, you know, 20 something year old niece. Oh, that's good to know. And that's how <laughs> it starts. But that's how it starts. You know what I mean? I, and I think I used to write off these younger people. And then I remember, oh, that's right. I'm in my 50s. And <laughs> they are the future of this goddess spirituality mm -hmm. so i want them to know the things that we know yeah otherwise we're fucked it's really we're important not, we're fucked, but the goddess movement is fucked yeah. if they don't know what we know yeah we, I, I feel like i'm working really hard to make sure that doesn't happen you are <laughs> you I'm really trying. are I'm trying. Yeah. oh and no I, you I, definitely I, are I, getting I, it out there i'm i mean i'm trying and I, and I think that Carla and Liz are trying really hard too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Carla needs to find the other academics who are dipping their toe into, you know, actually having a spiritual life. You know, it's funny, Devora, they said that because that you left academia in 2015, because Kelly and I just had this conversation this morning uh, about, wow. and actually it's funny that you said that, Liz, about the PhD, because I feel like when I got my PhD, I was very censored very, very censored. And so, you know, you have to present your list of books you want to read, you have to present your topic. Mm -hmm. And every turn, it was like censor, 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 not this person, not this person. Gimbutas barely made it on there. Wow. Um, because, wow. oh my really? God, like, I tried to put Merlin Stone as sort of the foundation of that early movement. No, more Merlin Stone. So, um, Wait, can I just ask a quick question? Was it because her her research is considered not sound now? I know that some of the issues around Maria Gambutis, but it, yeah, so it was basically a lot of goddess woo woo stuff. Ah. So they didn't want all the goddess woo woo stuff. You know, they were like, you can't be a serious academic and follow Gambutis. Basically, that's what they said to me. Um, and so I had to make an argument for why I put her on. Sorry, my argument, they're like, like real actual archaeological. Yes. Yes, she did. But because she labeled it goddess worship and she didn't label it statue of woman sitting. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Because she used that language, which now they're starting to do a lot more. If you go to museums, you see a lot of no one says goddess anymore. No one says it just says statue of woman holding breasts. 
or statue of they don't even name the god unless they know for sure like unless it's more um so can i, I yeah, can yeah. I just interrupt yes. yes do it so for example we have her i know i love her and she's only identified in the british museum as lady of the night but right? it, it does say she could be a rescue gal. It doesn't say Lilith. It doesn't say, I don't think it says Nana or Ishtar. And she's all three of those in, in my mind and other people's wow. minds. Yep. So, yes. And a fertility doll. I mean, yeah, the appellations are horrible. Uh, Kelly, what? I was completely unaware of this. And you guys need to know, need to tell me who I need to contact and who I can be outraged at. <laughs> <laughs> tell me. I will not remain silent. I will write letters, send emails, make phone calls. <laughs> that's it's, what it's I so do. sad because I had I had four women on my committee and three men, and the wow. women gave me the hardest time. Well, seven. My, my PhD is committee. hard. Wow. Yeah, yeah. they gave well, me a really hard time. Yeah, I, I wrote well, Carol about this in my. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say I wrote about this in my book. Um, that one of my personal realizations was that there aren't, there's nothing like, this is not a shock to you, but you know, there's nothing in our culture that is not built on a foundation of patriarchy. And that includes like just all of our cultural underpinnings. And that, in my experience, that includes academia, that includes the way we approach education, religion, like everything. And so if none of that has been built with, um, a more expansive perspective in mind, then I, I also felt like, what can I expect from it if I'm wanting to go into this space that, as you just so accurately named, Carla, is considered woo-woo? Like, what? How? How do those? How are those things gonna work together? Um, and I, and it's almost like a double. You know, we're, we're we're dealing with the history, like we're dealing with the fact that that people don't know this and that it's been suppressed, and then we're dealing with the fact that when we do want to explore it inside institutions that they're they're not built for that exploration you you can certainly correct me because like i said i have not pursued higher education in this but that was where my thinking was around this um carol christ was turned down on her first uh the first dissertation she wanted to do she had to start over i think on a whole new topic and uh i know judith plaskow also ran into huge problems and you would think that that wouldn't happen anymore so it's it's very but i know it does carla and it's very uh, upsetting to hear and it is certainly uh, one of the problems i would think you know within academia and the fact that if we want to if we want to have maybe because we want to go teach at a university so need the phd you know it is it is disheartening that uh you know i mean it affected my choice of of school i went to cis and um and then actually went back again for my phd i did most of my women's spirituality degree masters there but then uh, there was a big political upheaval, as you may know, and uh, 28 of us moved to New College and started a new program there. But um, yeah, there's just a lot that has yet to be unearthed. And one of the things that, that I, I want to mention when we talk about the history and what people don't know is about Inanna and the Enhedwana literature. All her literature to Inanna, all her praises, her lamentations, that's the first writing by the first woman of, and that's the first writer of record from 2350 BCE. How no many people this. know that exactly? No one knows this. I mean, the great thing is they just did at the, I'm um, going to forget the name now, a museum in New York. They I just, went. you went? Yes, I went. Morgan Library. It was fantastic. Morgan yes. Library, right. Yeah. The first place that I know of to have uh, such an exhibit like that, that really delved into this a few months ago. And we were so excited because this is something the New York Times Magazine should have covered years ago when Betty DeShong Meadow was still alive. You know, her books on Inanna and, and the, you know, dissection of, of all of it. Well, I will tell you though, even if you read the New York Magazine piece, um, there, there, there is questions. Did it, did she really write this? There, you you will find the speculation there, and it's so disheartening and painful. I mean, she's naming herself. You had priests copying her poems for hundreds of years. Like I don't know it, how much evidence you need. Um, right, we found thing, writings. Yeah, it, it's there. Like we got it, you know. Right. And still, there's questions. Wait, 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 w
Right. And that that is so frustrating. I will say too that I was moved to tears by that exhibit and not because it was it was small. It wasn't, you know, the Morgan Library is not a big place and it was right. I, I don't know, did you go there? No, no, there? I, okay. I'm in California. I would have loved to go. But, yeah. No. Um it, I, it, it's not a big room. I saw the see, virtual tour or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but to see all of it in one place. Oh yeah. And to see it treated with respect and like I I really I could cry about it now. I was like, "Oh my gosh, yeah. this is so rare and it shouldn't be that way. It really shouldn't be that way." Yeah. yeah. It should be taught like in in high schools for sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. And you know, divorce, when you say Carol Christ who I love and whose life I feel like I'm emulating. Uh, mm -hmm. Um you know, because I'm pulled to Crete and I want to build a center there. And I want, yes. but when I was in grad school and I found Carol Christ and I found her work and I was obsessed with it. Uh, one of my uh, PhD committee members was saying uh, the, like the, Carol Christ is a warning sign because she went off the deep end and went to Crete and never came back to academia. Oh my God. I, but, but can we not say that this is a sign of somebody who's a prophet, for example? Right. Which they might have said if she was a man. Mm, right. Um, Following his dreams, right? right Following right. his passions. His but for her, right. That's right. That's right. Uh, and she still is one of my, you know, sort of my, the people that I would like to emulate. But, but it's funny that you say it because I knew of her throughout my grad studies as sort of like, this is what happens if you go too far out there and then you're not taken seriously as an academic. Wow. Right. And even now, like I told Kelly, because I step, I'm stepping more and more away from academia myself. I published the book myself because everybody wants to tell you what to write and how to write and where <laughs> does it fit with their stuff. And I'm like, no, yeah. I can thank God I have the PhD attached to my name so that I can defend the research that I've done. Right. Not that it matters to everyone else except the academic. Right. Uh, but like you're saying, Kelly, finding people that stepped out. I mean, there are people that have stepped out, but they have left. I don't know that there's too many people straddling. I guess they're trying, but it's very hard to straddle because the minute you're not academically published, you kind of become disregarded in a sense. Like you're, you know, I don't know. I don't know. That's been just my experience. Uh, I don't know any other goddess writers in my university because we don't actually have, like you say, a women's spirituality program. That would never, that would never happen here. What, um, what's the university? Oh, York University in Canada. Oh, yeah. right, Canada right. is very conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're the liberal, the most liberal university in Canada. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think um, Annalisa Dare would be a really interesting person to have as part of this conversation. Carla, didn't you just do an interview with her fairly recently? I thought you yes, did. Yes, 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 yeah, yes. I did as well. And I know she's got, I don't know what her PhD is in, um, but I know that this you is. Told me, but I forgot too. I yeah. feel like it's mythology or something. And I know yeah, she's definitely. doing a yeah. deep dive around menstruation and there's a connection yeah. to Inanna, um, but she would be an yeah. interesting person to talk to as well at some point yeah. on this. Yeah. 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 So I guess the good news is we do seem to find ourselves smack in the middle of an incredible resurgence of an interest in goddess spirituality. Would you say that that is true? Yes. And is that what we're all kind of collectively experiencing? Do you think that's true, Devorah, based on what you're seeing? I do. I don't know numbers. You know, I always never feel we're reaching enough people, but, uh, but I think so. I think there is a groundswell. And it is hard to be sure because you know, the people whose posts I see on Instagram are people that I often have followed. So, you know, it's a bubble. Right, right. It's, it's hard to get a read on that because uh, I'm the same, right? And especially since that's how the algorithm works, right? I'm being right. shown what I'm right. interested in. So it would be interesting to, to know if there are statistical studies somewhere, like if <laughs> somebody somewhere this is where we need the academics right like somebody somewhere is probably doing a study and maybe in a master's program right of you don't know about it right of, of goddess worship or goddess worshipers or people practicing a goddess religion and i'll be honest i i think we owe a lot to a resurgence in witchcraft right because a lot of witches work with a lot of goddesses mm -hmm. so they are feeding and and kind of fanning the flames of goddess worship but again that's where i saw the most 
misinformation about, I mean, half of the witches I knew, more than half, who were working with goddesses that all the information they knew about said goddess was either in incomplete or in completely inaccurate. Mm. So that's a problem. And that's why, we, you know, we've had episodes like the inaccuracies about Lilith in Sabrina, the teenage witch and, and Lilith in, uh, you know, that the last two seasons of uh, True Blood and, I, you know what I mean? Yeah, oh, warrior I know. nun. Warrior nun. I just saw an episode warrior last. Nun. Night. I know another. Don't get me started. Another show that was canceled because I know. God forbid, because that you know that's where that the direction of that show was going in, right? There was going to be a goddess. Oh no doubt, yeah, yeah, and questioning. And the it people. was, and it was the it was a long line of shows that were canceled on next Netflix because there was lesbian content and strong female character leads. I Don't get me, that's a whole other show. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I, I feel like there's, so for me, since I've stepped out of the academic closet, I've been approached like en masse by people that I, and so I feel like people are thirsty to know, like they want to know. But you're right, I think you're right, Devorah, in the sense that they don't want to read as much. I have this Goddess Reads book club on Facebook. I try to get people to come read a book with me. So what I'm doing now is I pick a book a month and I do quotes from that book. And then maybe I'm maybe we'll get a, a meeting together. Um, so you're trying to present not necessarily always just academic books, but any books on the goddess that are, you know, interesting. So I think like there, but there is a thirst. Like I find the minute that you talk about goddesses, there's a lot of women and some men who are like, I want to learn. I want to know how do I go about it? It is also true that a lot of people don't want to do a four or five year degree, you know, to, to do that. So maybe we are like, maybe there is a, a burgeoning, like you said, but it's sort of now because of all the things that are in the air, how do we, how do I we don't know. get that done? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great, though, that you're feeling that. Yeah. 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 And I know a lot of people who are like, when I tell them, like, I want to build a center and I want to build a temple to Artemis mm -hmm. and to have, you know, people are fascinating. Everybody. And I just had another a friend of mine say, uh, if you're building something in Crete, then maybe I'll build something over here and we can connect. And I thought, oh, my God, what a dream if we could rebuild temples to the sacred feminine. Right. And interconnect like, oof. I got chills oh, now. <laughs> Definite chills on that one. Yeah, I know. Dream, yeah. Well, that's my that's my dream for the Church of the Goddess. If mm -hmm, that if mm -hmm. we build one, we will build many. Yeah. If we build many, they will start building them in other countries. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing you know, we have a global church that unifies every goddess path ever walked, every. Yeah place ever <laughs> that's the dream it's life-changing information it for sure. yeah it is perhaps the fact that we're dreaming it though is already a sign that things are changing and the so. first step uh, yeah yeah and hopefully in Devorah's lifetime we'll come up with the technology to make her live forever so <laughs> <laughs> oh <No>, please no <laughs> No, but we are trying to or maybe yeah. just upload maybe just upload your brain to the cloud. And I actually just put my dissertation on academia and uh, after all these years because a friend was encouraging it, and I have several friends who are to to your point, Kelly, uh, who are aware that we need to think about legacy and that we're trying to collect our work and and get it out yeah. there. As, 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 yeah. As a preservationist and an archivist, I, I also would strongly encourage you. Well, I would also, that. thank you. I would also just say um, uh, that if you know of any libraries, what I'm worried about is my where my life, physical library goes when I die. So if you have any thoughts about that, um, please do let me know. I, I have to go in a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to say that, yeah. yeah. I will give that some thought. A lot of libraries don't seem to want books, you know, I mean, it's yep. crazy, even before COVID. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we need a new goddess library. We do. We actually do. Right. Well, I love that idea. That's yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, so I want the church to have its own library. Mm. So. Mm. Putting that out there. Yeah. Yeah, we may need a goddess library or several goddess libraries. We may need to start collecting right. the both the physical one and the digital one that people can access yeah. online. Yeah. Yeah. Well, into that and too, are you're making me think of um, I don't know how many of you know Trista Hendren of Girl God Books, but I know yep. that she's long held a dream to have um an art gallery um where she's got sacred feminine art from around the world um that she yeah. would have in Norway, um, which would also be amazing. Amazing. Yeah. A standing art gallery just for goddess work and goddess and sacred feminine. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's what the fundraising is for. I mean, we could really, you know, we just, we need a little more, but uh, it's possible. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great idea. We don't have to wait, like, I mean, for the government or the patriarchy or whatever to give it to us. Right. We just have to figure out a goddess model and a business model, you know, like a goddess business model to create right. these spaces. Because right. I think women will come, mm -hmm. you know, but like if you build it, they will come. I, kind of I, yeah. I think yeah. that, I, yeah, I do think that women are, are hungry. I think it is yeah. absolutely no accident that, because you know me, right? There are no coincidences, only providence. Mm -hmm. Right, no coincidence, only providence. So this goddess resurgence and this, it is time for the collapse of the patriarchy, burn everything to the ground mentality and women are angry and rightfully so are happening at the same time is, you know, everything is in divine order. Well, to have it as part of uh, of the Church of the Goddess it would be a great idea and would not be very costly if we did the digital version first. Right. Seems to me. Yeah. That's right. mm -hmm. And more so much, much more accessible, of course. Yeah. I have so much to do, my friends. <laughs> we need 30 hour days. Huh? Right. So I think the answer is how do we bridge the gap of knowledge? Well, us. <laughs> Really, <laughs> you know, the ones we've been with, right. we've been waiting for, right? <laughs> we are well, the ones. And, and and Liz, you and I talked about that, right? That this is this is the way, right? I think we, maybe the fact I, that we're like having the, the conversation is it's happening, like, and so yeah, yeah. may this may this spark more, you know, may people hear it and yes, you know. yes, and and you know, I plan to have more panel conversations like this, so. I think hopefully that will be helpful moving forward. Well, Devora, I know that you have to run and I think we're just over an hour anyway, or just about at an hour. So, um, okay, ladies. Well, I'm going to do my thing that I do and just end abruptly in the screen. <laughs> off the Zoom. Uh, Thank but. you for bringing us together. This yes, is, thank you yes. for this conversation. Thank yes. you. Fabulous. And I yes. look forward to doing it again. Yes. Enjoy the rest of your day. Be excited about where we're at and what's to come. <laughs> Until I see each of you again, Carla, I'll probably see you sooner than others. <laughs> May the peace and the love of the goddess be with you. Yes. And with you. Thank you. Much gratitude. Me too. Bye, ladies. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching The Girlfriend God on YouTube. If you enjoy this podcast, the best way you can support it is to like it, follow it, leave comments on the page, rate it, review it, share it with your friends. But most of all, subscribe to this channel. And if you want more of The Girlfriend God, you can find The Girlfriend God on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Thanks again for watching.